So listen, uh, I just want to point out something here, uh, and, and I, so I know you're all quiet, but this was an invitation only uh, thought leader seminar, and the cost of breakfast is that you ask questions. <laughs> so this is, and we brought two outstanding speakers in that uh, have uh, terrific, um, terrific things for us to build on. I agree, Chancellor, and thank you for the coffee because I'm always happy to <laughs> coffee. Thank you both so much for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Ann Lampkin Williams, and I have the pleasure of serving as Dean for the College of Education and Health Human Services. So I have two questions, and it's really one for each of you. First, um, for our, our president, uh, how have you worked or how are you working to make sure this continues after you no longer are serving as president? And for your faculty colleague, can you touch on how this has impacted or how you plan on it impacting your recruitment of faculty uh, going forward? Okay, so thank you for the question. Um, the, when I said excellent ex execution, that means structural and sustainable solutions, um, not dependent on a single individual. So one thing we did in designing purposeful work, because I was set, People think I'm a, a nutcase about the philosophy, but let's just be clear, because they'd rather like get on with it. But we spent almost five years with the, the philosophy in design and just launching the modules like purposeful work and launching and assessing them, launching the internship program, assessing it, et cetera. And I kept the group doing that to, it was about three people, and they reported directly to me because I wanted this tight link between philosophy and tactics. So when it was sort of grown up enough um, to come out of the incubator, we hired a senior associate dean for purposeful work. His name is Alan Long. He is terrific. Um, and sorry, the whole time we were developing it, career services was sitting over here doing its regular career services things, and we were launching these other models. When Alan came, he brought the purposeful work modules and philosophy together and brought in the career services staff, and all, I think 80% of them are still there. They have blossomed under this kind of inspiring approach, commitment to ex excellent edu execution, and they're the ones who are keeping all of this alive. So um, it, one always worries that one's successor may have as his first priority to stomp out the legacy of his predecessor or their <laughs> predecessor. So there's always that danger, but, I, but we have made it as systematic and structural and sustainable as we possibly can. And about the faculty, I, so we're working really diligently to increase the number of faculty of color and uh, at, at Bates. But also, I would just say like even more expand, I'll, I'll just give a tangible example. We have two job ads out right now, so you could look them up. Um, one's in biology and one's in environmental science. And we're, we're using the recruiting, you know, oftentimes when you read a job ad, it's like, and you need to do this, and you'll do this, and you'll do this, right? And so we've kind of turned that on its ear to say, like, why would you want to come here? <laughs> so we've really tried to add in to our job ads our, not just our commitment, but the things that we're doing at Bates structurally and systemically to increase inclusion. And I think it's, a, you know, to me, some people say, oh, what if some people don't apply? And I'm like, thank God then, if they don't, right? I mean, the whole point is that we, we, we want to show what we're doing, be authentic about it, and also be honest that, that we're, this is a journey and we, we have a lot to do. But um, I think that's one of the real things that we're doing. And also doing training, um, bias training for faculty uh, to really learn how to have inclusive searches and to, and to really be open to different kinds of skill sets and things like that. So. Yeah, we are working on that, though. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Pam Hitley, the director of um, Equity, Civil Rights, and the Title IX office. So I'm not a faculty member, but I have a question for you, April, which is, um, so you had me at hello with all of this. I'm like, I'm so <laughs> into it. It totally works. Um, but I imagine when you, when you started working on this, you may have had faculty who had the perspective of, but we need those leader courses. 
Yes. Oh, 100%. How were you able, and it, I, maybe it was a majority of your faculty, maybe it wasn't, but how were you able to create a critical mass of faculty to effectuate this change? Um, <coughs> so, because there's a problem across the country, and I, I've, I've worked for a long, for even before I came to Bates, I worked with a national group called the Partnership for Undergraduate Life Science Education Leadership Fellows, which is a group to sort of help. So I got a lot of training <laughs> before I came to Bates. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, and I say this to my fellow senior, senior leaders, you need senior people that have a long track record of teaching students and doing work with students at, like to take a lead. That's number one. So because there will be people that say, what if we lose our accreditation? Or what if we, like, we, we, we need this kind of course to get the good students. Um, but I, so there's one piece is that like we need people to take that p article of faith that if we change the curriculum, our students will still do really good. I was lucky when I came to Bates because I had a whole other slide deck from another comparable institution where we had changed a lot of things. And I, I could pretty much say like, I know this will work, but I think you need another piece too, which is, to me, it's the social justice piece, right? I mean, I, I don't know how you can say that a student, that, that any student that comes into your institution, if, if you learn about the history of this, of, of, of this country, of, of colonialism and white supremacy, I don't understand how you can say that we need to weed anyone out of any class because no one had any control over the K through 12 education that they got. And I, I will say, I mean, again, we're an institution founded you know, by abolitionists. And so maybe, maybe at Bates, our faculty, um, that might have pulled at them a little bit more, but but I've been doing this work at some other school. I, I used to be in the South and worked with you know Southern accredited schools where a few that didn't have those kinds of points of view. And um, I I would just say there's not one answer. You got to come at it from both evidence and data. There's a ton of literature to show that students thrive better in these revised curriculums. And it's not just, it's not students of color only or first gen students, all the students do better. Um, there's, the, there's the purpose for the faculty piece. So I, I wish I had like a perfect answer, but I think all those things are things you have to consider. And can I just jump in on one thing, which is our mission as an educational institution is to offer a life transforming education. And um, so if you're offering a life deforming education to those people in the bottom circles, it, you're not fulfilling your mission. You don't have to even ever say the equity inclusion words. It's like to me, if, if a surgeon loses 60% of his patients, what would we call that? Malpractice, right? So if we're going to invite students here, that, that is a, we are the initiators. We say, you come here, and then we're not going to live up to our half of the bargain. And to me, those, those circles of the first chart are a complete indictment of our obliviousness and stubbornness and lack of imagination. And what April has done, as, I mean, just to, I used to have many, many students coming in to me saying they wanted to be a doctor to go back to their community, and they just got completely nuked by the introductory course, and that dream was gone. And so that, it's just, it's t totally, I think, of the essence of our mission. Thank you, um, I have a follow-up to Anne's question um, about recruiting new faculty. I'd like to hear more about your efforts to retrain old faculty because <laughs> I find that um, so I find that sometimes this place squashes that creativity out of us. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and 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 it's why in my talk I um, talked about the locus being the department or the, the unit, because that's usually where the real work is done of thinking about the curriculum and curricular change. Um, and 
I, I recommend if you really want to get that, that sort of training in situ in the space where it needs to happen longer term, like learning communities within departments. So I had the biology department, that data didn't come from nowhere, right? So there were, there were people that did not want to change. Um, but through a, it felt slow at the time, and as Clayton said, when you look backwards on things, I've only been at Bates for, this is my fifth year, a lot of things have changed. It felt really painful and slow in the process to have, in my department, a one, once a week meeting where we read a paper and we learned about the fixed mindset of faculty and why the fixed mindset of faculty keeps students at, like we, and the, we had no problem finding evidence-based papers to guide us mm -hmm. or we brought in someone to talk. Um, we did a workshop, uh, we did a great workshop actually just recently where, you know, a lot of faculty started to learn but then they said, I don't feel comfortable even saying the word race in class. I said, okay, there are people that can teach us. There's a great, my, I'm going to put a plug in for a colleague of mine. Her name is Bedelia Richards at the University of Richmond. She teaches these workshops called Race Talk. And she really helps you learn to both situate your own identity with your students and, and, and learn respectfully and without doing harm, because that's very important. Um, how to how to have those kinds of conversations. So I would just say it's slow and it feels painful. And I would say that you have to do work to protect if you do have faculty in, in your departments that come from marginalized groups, you may need to also think about how you protect them from having to hear and listen to white faculty perform all kinds of things in front of them. And so sometimes you might need to just do some training that with those faculty in particular, but I, I would say work on the department level if you can possibly do that, um, and it needs to be ongoing. It can't be one, one thing at a time. It has to be very systemic. Good morning. Thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. My name is Amy Finley, and I'm the Dean of Students, and one of the things I was thinking about for the presentation is mental health of students and how an increased sense of belonging on your campus might be contributing to some improved um, mental health outcomes, and I'm just wondering if you could share any information you might have about that. Mental health on our campus is a top priority um, this year because, of course, students across the country are struggling as are ours. So, it's interesting, we just did a, tr a, our trustees are here this week and we just did a presentation, our student affairs staff. I, I don't like it when mental health becomes the top label. I like to think of student, student well-being because then everything April's doing, everything we're doing in purposeful work, everything, the multi-faith chaplaincy, which is all comers at a place like Bates is doing. Um, the well-led athletic teams are doing. Um, the increasing sort of fluency of our faculty with, um, with concepts of how you run a class not to make peel, people feel devalued and marginalized and like they do not even want to go back to that class. Um, I think, so I consider that working on the front end so that the number of people who are in a genuine sort of medical mental health crisis, that's probably not going to change. But the number of students, I mean, the, one of the issues is society-wide, the bucket of mental health has become a kind of universal label. Um, and it, the, the level of anxiety and stress of the contemporary student is really high and was made ever more so by COVID. Um, but I do think all of this, the student affairs side is um, so important to, and, and we've also got renovated the way we do student affairs too. So um, it's, it's a really important point. And when it's working, I think it's, it is driving down the numbers that end all the way up at the back end. I spend more time on the chair of the National Sciences Department here. So uh, this may be working for biology, and I, I'd like to institute it in our department, but what about the chemists? 
<laughs> what about the physicists? I mean, is there any headway with those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, <clears throat> I spoke from my department because I know it the best. Um, but I'll, I'll, like in physics, for example, one of the huge inequities that we saw was that you know we only had one gateway physics series, and as you probably know in physics, that's got to be calculus based, and it's really geared to future physicists and engineers. And our life science majors were just crushed in this course, and and they also didn't find themselves in it because the examples were really different. And so one thing that we did is our physics department has created two paths. Um, in physics now, and so there's still the physics for physics majors, and and, the, and 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 this isn't like an easier physics course. It's 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 actually was developed with really great like examples, like um, how does an MRI work, right? And, you know things that like the life sciences students actually really can hang their hat on, um, and some changed pedagogies, and so that's a one example, like where physics said, okay, one thing we know we're doing is we're eliminating um, <clears throat> the other thing another thing physics has worked on is they haven't had a lot of women um, and so they've in, in their discipline and so they've been doing a lot of work thinking about how they change the culture in the department so that it feels and the same thing we have a digital and computational studies major that includes um, you know work in computer science and though both of those groups have been doing a lot to think about what does culture look like what kind of examples do we use in classes so our, like for example our math uh, department now has a math and social justice course that a lot of students are gravitating towards it's still the same math right but like the examples the students are really find some a reason to be in there so that's just a few examples but um, I'm just gonna be honest, biology at Bates, I, it's different at every, I've been to so many places and I've heard so much data. It was the worst data on campus and so we really had the biggest impetus to do the most change. That's different at different places. Um, but our chemistry department has moved away from high, high stakes testing. So they do more frequent assessments um, and they also now allow students, so the students like take an assessment <coughs> and even just changing the name from test to assessment that's a psychological thing for students right but they but when they do the assessment then they have the opportunity to revisit the things that they missed not only to rework problems but anyone could game that right they could figure out how to go do it but they have to write a metacognitive reflection this is what I was thinking when I answered the problem that way I've reworked the problem this is now what I understand um, and so those kinds of things, like teaching those kinds of study skills and reflections in class, those are just a few examples of some of my colleagues in other departments. And hi, I'm Mike Bukowski uh, from the math department. So this will fall back on your uh, point about mathematics. And I think that you made this allusion to earlier about getting this open letter from your students saying, like, here's our leader, our leader course, and here's a very organic assessment of what's happening in the course. I feel oftentimes that when we try to get information from our students like this about saying, What's your assessment of algebra or pre-calculus or calculus? We oftentimes rely too heavily on surveys, and there might be a survey overload for some students. We may fail to capture some of that organic information of how students actually feel in the class. So I feel welcome in this class. This class is useful for me. Could you maybe offer some suggestions on, aside from surveys, and aside from organic open letters, what might be a good form for our faculty or for our, our college to engage our students in the very different levels from algebra to calculus and different levels of leader courses, people going to business or engineering or staying in mathematics? I would recommend partnering with someone on your, on your campus that maybe is either maybe in your institutional research or maybe, you know, someone in like psychology that might have some um, uh, skills in doing like participatory action research, which is basically the idea of like, you don't need to ask every student how they're doing. You could do some focus groups, and that's something that I've seen work well at quite a few schools. The idea of pulling some focus groups from those cohorts of students that have, you know, those constituencies that you're interested in, and having a, a, a trained facilitator, so asking them, you know, telling, first of all, telling them how important their opinion is to this institution, how much you care and want to change experiences for future students, so the situating of how you ask them to come, and then having someone do that focus group that knows how to peel away the layers that we just don't get when we send out surveys. And, and that had to have, we did that at Bates, we also did that at my former institution, I've seen it done several places where you can get to the whys 
And what about that is a, is a challenge? And, and so I think that would be a tactic. So I'm Gassan Krigli, Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science. I'm professor, and I say professor because I care about teaching, and that's why I'm in this position. Um, a couple of things that we are doing here, so your presentations were really great to reinforce what we're doing and, and let us know that we're doing something uh, similar to what others are doing. But, um, you know, we have a program for people, students who are underprepared to start an engineering degree. And the purpose of the program was to really help them move fast so that they can progress towards a degree or find another passion or work, maybe a degree that is a better fit for them. However, you know, I, I see that some of the, the students in the program are predominantly kind of like from certain racial groups, socioeconomic groups, because the schools they went to did not prepare them well. So now this becomes more like an exclusion from being in the mainframe. And I wanted to know what approaches you might have done or whether the engineering seminar, I mean the first year seminar, is a more appropriate place for students of this type. So that's one, one uh, question I had and then maybe I'll have a follow up. I mean, I'm gonna give you two answers. One answer is and I, and I know you can't solve this because I, I understand engineering curricula as well. But one, one thing is like when we even say are the, stu the students aren't prepared, it's like, well, then maybe we need to blow up the curriculum in the first place. But I know that that's not going to happen. Like I know how hard it is to make that happen. And so I, I, I would recommend that if you're thinking about, I think that we just, if we're going to go from deficit-minded to asset-minded, and in, you know, equity and inc like thinking about inclusion is that whatever you're going to do is this sort of bringing in a cohort to get them to the space that they need to be so that they can start your gateway curriculum, which I also hope you keep working on, right, to make more inclusive, is really that it needs to be about their assets and it needs to be about uh, building up a cohort. You know, so when we do our STEM scholars program, right, we, we don't say like, it, there's nothing remedial about it. Like, you are scholars. You got into the, this institution, and we think that you have every ability. We also know, though, that some of us got to build some skills here. And so we do a lot of, like, um, and actually, I'm pretty sure, because I know you all worked with WPI, and they have a great framework about using um, some group work to help students talk about the cultural capital, the various kinds of capital they have, right? So making sure that you're building them up, the students building up, what they already know how to do in assets, and then talking more about we're filling in skill sets, and everyone doesn't need to fill in the same skill set, right? That's a different paradigm, just like purposeful work, right? In some ways, yeah, some students, like purposeful work is about them thinking about getting career, but it's actually they learn it's something different. If you can sort of build up your students as, um, we just all recognize we didn't get all the same thing. This isn't remedial because you're, you're not smart. We actually know you're, we know you're really smart and capable, but we're gonna fill these things in. Might not be the same thing for each person. I think that framework, you could do it through a seminar. I mean, you could do it in a lot of ways, but to me it's about the mentality. With how, they should never hear the words, you're not ready, right, for this. They should, they should hear, uh, we need to get ready for you and the skills that you have, and this is what we're gonna do to do it. And I would just say to reinforce one point, which is the world wants these students you're talking about that may that that you described as just not ready to go into the curriculum as is. But what we're seeing with the kinds of internship opportunities those two young women who were STEM scholars got, the Broad Institute, the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, and the CDC? Caltech. No, Caltech. Um, so that's who the world is looking for. So one thing any leadership in these institutions should understand is the more successful you are there, the more stuff that you try and measure and it succeeds, the better the whole institution becomes. It's a little bit like UMBC, um, Freeman Rabowski's um, you know, University of Baltimore, of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, those students are just grabbed up. So there's something, there's like a, 
a, a institutional uh, success, recognition, all the things that, that leadership want um, in an institution and that everybody then um, enjoys. And it, it's a way of creating the party around these issues um, because the outcomes are startlingly better. You said that you have about 2,000 students. We have about 9,000. Um, what's your faculty to student ratio at Bates? 10 to 1. And we have a five course teaching load, which is a heavy load in our world. Um, it, it, but our, I would say that course distribution is quite unequal in terms of the, I mean, the, the social sciences dominate in terms of numbers. Increasingly, biology and chemistry are getting huge numbers. Uh, if, if you're a humanities professor, smaller enrollments, et cetera. So I don't, what is your ratio here? I don't know. It's about 18 to 1. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a quite a meaningful yeah, difference. Yeah. Individualized, I hate to use the word intervention, but, you know, they are very, person-centric. I mean, it takes a lot of woman hours to, um, to do these types of interventions. I, though I would, I would argue <coughs> that the, the changing the curriculum piece, like if you have to start somewhere, the course-based experiences, um, first of all, they can hit every one of your students, right? So it's like all of the students, at, at Bates now we can say like we guarantee all of these students coming in STEM have two times to get an authentic research experience, part of a class. And you can, act, I mean, you can have a good number of students. It does, it does take work and coordination. It also sometimes takes some extra support staff, but that costs less than faculty. I'm, and, and I'm saying this because I, I've also talked to other schools across the country that are really bringing that course-based, problem-based stuff into the classroom. I think that's the place to start when an economy of scale is, is, is important. And I can assure you, all students at Bates vastly prefer the new bio curriculum. All students. Doesn't matter what their backgrounds are. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joan Arsky. I'm the chair of the Mathematics and Statistics Department. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the different pathways to the curriculum. I find uh, STEM faculty can be very linear. Um, and so uh, how did you implement that? It seems like there would be some coordination involved. And I'm also wondering about the partnerships. You seem to have these really meaningful um, experiences, for example, in the, in the freshman biology course. Um, and with that, you had to go out into the community and build things that actually fit in your curriculum. I'm wondering how you did that. I'll do the second one first. So our Center for Purposeful Work, I mean, we put them to work for us is what we do. Um, part of what they do is help us make connections in the community. Um, and so a lot of our courses, that's where we get, like there, there's like one person in Purposeful Work helps science faculty find connections in the, I mean, it, they're not hard to find. There are a lot of people, a lot of companies and a lot of places would like to have a, a stake and, and students and their institution as part of their own outreach. Um, but we, we, we definitely get help. But sometimes, I, in the case of like the Bigelow Labs, we actually read an article that they got that grant. And um, my colleague, one of my colleagues just emailed the lead on the grant and said, that is so interesting. Are you looking at the microbiomes? That's something we know how to do. And they said, oh, actually we talked about that, but we didn't really have people to do it. And we were like, Okay, we're going to pitch this idea to you. So we, we, so we did have to go out and do that work. We pitched that maybe we could do a partnership. I tried to sell to them. I'm like, I bet you'll get more grant money if you are impacting several hundred students a year on your grant. Because, I mean, I'm, I've been a reviewer for National Science Foundation and NIH for a long time. I know that they care about that. And I was right. Um, like, their broader impacts, which are us, we are part of their broader impacts, like, that, that's, that's been a huge thing. Um, so is, 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 is it extra work? Yes, but I'll just say like that joy part that I talked about. Like I'm having so much more fun teaching that class. 
um, my colleagues that you know teach these classes, they're just having a better time, and so it was worth the work. I, I forgot the first question. Oh, the pathways. Um, <coughs> the pathway does take coordination, right? Because the first thing people say with the pathway, they're like, if you can start in this course, you know, like I'm, this is the common thing in my department, a couple of people. I expect when they come to my course, they know and they know these things and they know how to do these things. But then again, when they talk about the students, they always say, you know what, they just don't know how to do that and they don't know how to do that. So to me, it's like a catch-22 because, but I think that what we had to do is really be intentional about the learning outcomes and be able to say, okay, so, you know, the, the students do start in one place, but then after that, they have a couple of paths that they can go down. There's going to be some very distinct learning outcomes in this class. There might be some overlapping ones in, in, in these classes, but we are going to ensure that the content um, and the concept students are learning um, isn't too overlapping, right? So yeah, it took a lot of coordination in order to do that. It also took one big thing, and some people just can't get to that space, which you know, in biology, when I started off in biology, like the textbook, it's like this. And now it's like, well, it's like that fat if you try to fit it in, but then it's got like all these supplements online, right? The, the, the disciplines have really grown. And you just have to be able to say, I bet people are gonna be okay. And as this is, I'm saying it flippantly because I actually have data to show they are. They're gonna be fine if they don't learn every single thing you think they need to know. Better to teach them a set of skills and critical thinking and data analysis and how to find that kind of information. And that, I mean, I, I have years of data to show that students that take these courses go on to excellent grad programs, excellent med schools, excellent jobs. And so they, they weren't disadvantaged in the way we imagine that they're going to be when they take courses like this. Uh, yes, uh, Mitch Holmer, Associate Provost. Uh, also a faculty member of political science. So I had a privilege of talking to you last night about Brian Dewsbury. So I just want to give a plug since you mentioned him. We have him available. He is cohorting our faculty over 40, uh, talking about a lot of things, and particularly what you just said. He mentioned last week in our um, active learning classroom. I highly recommend uh, senior academic leadership if you can think of faculty who might uh, take advantage of this opportunity, having Brian uh, cohorting was great. And he actually mentioned coming back because he wants to experience some Detroit jazz, so <laughs> well, we might have him back in person, but um, uh, I just want to put that plug in there. And I, I think what April says and what we've heard from Brian and others is absolutely critical for learning, giving that space and making room. And actually, it's a good segue to the WPI and, team and you know we had talked about how faculty from all four colleges on our campus are, are sort of building um, skill set tool sets around micro uh, skills for PBL and uh, it gets into segues with what Brian and you have talked about. Um, one thing that I have a question about is have you had the opportunity to use curricular analytics in your approach so this gets into so we partner with John Gardner on a program where we have a number of disciplines that are looking at kind of a macro level revamping of their program, whether it's course redesign, but they are using curricular analytics. And this, this is sort of a new way of thing. It's been around for 10, 15 years, and it, 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 it visualizes the curriculum pathway, and it does blocking factors, and there's a lot into it. And it kind of shows to faculty, because most of us are visual learners, not looking at a table of data, exactly how problematic the curriculum is, right? When it comes to prereqs, code required co-reqs, those type of things. And I, I think that kind of approach, at least in the conversations we've had about Gardner, it kind of shows you uh, in a real way, right? In a snapshot view, but also with some quantitative data behind it, um, the hard truths of our curriculum. Obviously, it's gotta be married with a lot of other things, so. Ask that. I mean, we're using some of that, not to the extent like I, I saw a great talk by someone, I think, at um, Georgia Tech in their use of the curricular analytics with huge sample sizes of students to show, like to really help pinpoint where the barriers were. Um, 
and I think it's smart if you if you you know even can do that a little bit because I as I said I think everyone needs to sort of they sort of enter where the problem is from a different space and it can really help show that yeah and my other because um, Mike you had mentioned uh, students um, and we had talked about this about surveys um, the focus group approach we used it during COVID we uh, did focus groups of students and we're actually going to be doing it now um, as a follow-up to student survey um, you know are, are there particular areas that you suggest that we you know uh, look at because obviously we're developing this right now we haven't yet deployed um, the focus groups but um, we're doing as a follow-up to a student survey on teaching uh, student experience, needs, modalities, those type of things. And uh, we're looking at the data to kind of glean out what exactly we want to touch base on. Uh, but it would be much more than just obviously what's in the classroom. It would be their co-curricular, their student life experience. So um, any advice? I think if you can collaborate with someone that has expertise and sense of belonging, those folks know really good questions to ask to sort of dig out like like when when in the classroom do you feel supported you know when in the classroom do you feel like your peers think you can succeed I, I think that if you can you know really collaborate with folks that that know how to ask those kinds of questions you'll get a much richer data set in your focus groups so i, I have a question for each of you uh april when a faculty member wants to convert a course, do they get course release, or are they expected to do that over the summer, or how the, me the mechanics of that, and I have a question for the Yeah, I mean, for, like, luckily, that's part of what our HHMI funding will help people with. I will say that everyone has not taken advantage of it. So some faculty just, they're like, I'm changing my course. And then I learned that they did these huge changes. And I was like, well, you know, we had money with HHMI. So it, it wasn't, and I'm only saying that because I don't know that everyone needs that same incentive. But we do. We have this course redevelopment fund. And a, a faculty can apply for, um, for some funding to, to, to redevelop, you know, to do a redevelopment of their course um, through, through our it, grant. Do they do it during the academic year or in the summer? Both. But, and again, it's very like faculty specific, what they need. Like we also have a, um, we have this one thing at Bates that they, they've had for a long time. It's it's called a- Course redesign? Course redesign. It, <laughs> it, yeah, it, I'm, yeah. Ahead, you can talk about we, we needed a strategy to get the faculty to accept practitioner taught courses um, in a precious liberal arts college, right? So in order to do that, we paired, um, practitioner taught courses, they were established at the same time with course redesigns, which meant that a faculty member who normally has 25 students in the short term, that one month intensive course, so that the faculty member could take six students and put them in a class with the faculty member to redesign the course. So students So the students on, are contributing the students, to the redesign. There, it's an ongoing focus group for the whole intense one month period. So to redesign a course that then is deployed in the regular curriculum. And any, there are four or, or, or five opportunities a year, and faculty can, can sign up to do that. So that's part of their teaching load. It's an incredible experience for students because they are seeing what's behind the curtain of a syllabus. I mean, it's, it's, you're not just seeing the show, you're seeing what goes into making the show. And it also really helps faculty get much more compelling exercises in the class because there's just such generational difference in what these students are paying attention to and what their frames of reference are. So, so that's also available and across any, anything in the curriculum and people are using it to do, do it for inclusive purposes. Clayton, for you, uh, going back to a, a comment you made, when I was at Smith College, I was invited to another elite liberal arts school to talk about the engineering program. At the end, I asked them if they had considered starting an engineering program. They said, oh, heavens no, we would never do anything that practical and applied. <laughs> so I'm wondering about your uh, purposeful work center. And you presented a, a lot of compelling information about it. 
But could you talk about the dark side? Could you talk about the pushback you got, what it was, and how you dealt with it with, with faculty members that may not have been on board? Or maybe, maybe everybody's on board. So not to paint too rosy a picture, I think by keeping it in design phase for five years, it, it wasn't, we didn't off with their heads to a career center. This was not about our career center, good or bad. Um, no faculty were required to incorporate a purposeful work um, element, but over 50% of our faculty have into their regular courses. So there's no coercion on the faculty side. And everybody sees that the student experience, one, one of my strategies, which was real, I said I was concerned that our marginalized students were underperforming the value of their degree because they didn't have all that extra parental network thing going on as they're trying to gain experience and then bridge somewhere in the, the world. So I have always referred to purposeful work as the third leg of the equity promise. First is get these students in the door. Second, support them for success. And you've seen a fantastic example of how that happened. And third, support them to see their life as having a bunch of choices and understand, decode the mechanisms for getting there. So with all of that, there really wasn't pushback on purposeful work because by the time we created the Center for Purposeful Work, people were sort of like, I thought we've had that. Um, I mean, I don't know yeah. if you, and, and there's no coercion, no faculty member has to do it. But the other thing is that purpose is all over the place in our society. So I think it feels intuitive now. I think faculty want to be relevant. And so, like as Clayton said, it launched maybe smaller, but then the students all talk about it. Oh, well, I had this purposeful work infusion course and so-and-so that's an alum, can you believe she runs this company, she came. Then, they, like, you're in faculty meeting and if you're not doing it, you're like, well, geez, like, the students aren't gravitating. That's what we're seeing. Actually, I'll tell you the truth. What we're seeing in STEM is there are some senior faculty in fact, they're enacting some not great things, uh, I think, on our junior faculty, like questioning their rigor and questioning things because students aren't coming to their classes. And it's, um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but we're working towards, like we're working through it. it. There is a painful part. I don't want to pretend like there's not, there is. Sorry. Hi, Lisa Martin. Um, I have a joint appointment in two colleges. So I'm a professor in Women's and Gender Studies and uh, in the College of Art, Science, and Letters and Health and Human Services in the College of Education, Health and Human Services, where I serve as the department chair for HHS. And so I was wondering a little bit on the points you just made. I, I like how you kept your Center for Purposeful Work small and close to you as you were developing it. But then as it did launch, a lot of times there are faculty, whether it's faculty of color or in my discipline in things like women's and gender studies or maybe sociology in these small liberal arts studies where there are faculty who have long been doing the burden of that invisible labor with some of our more vulnerable students. And could you talk a little bit about how maybe you had to, or could you recognize the expertise of how that invisible labor was happening on campus and whether you were able to leverage or bring those faculty in on some of these? <coughs> initiatives early on as like maybe as thought leaders or as kind of stakeholders early on to help with that launch or did you think about issues like that yeah i would to be honest i would say that was a less of a fact that is very much a factor on the minds of how we think equitably about career trajectories and understanding that really constant high level invisible labor, but it's become visible, right? We, in purposeful work, um, there, so I'm trying to think, faculty were less involved in the tactics of how we create the exposure and experiences for students. Um, and I think those who were interested had a wide open door and some grant funding to bring it into their classes. So I don't think that was as much of an issue as it is in career trajectory and in, in all the 
sort of education and training we're trying to do on racial equity matters, and they're like, hello, we've been here 40 years just in this territory, and it is exhausting, and good luck with that. And so there, I think that's more where the resistance has been. Well, and that's what I would say when we changed our tenure and promotion guidelines, it was exactly why, right? To make the invisible labor visible and to literally name, because we did know that, right? That we are, we, there were already lots of folks in the women and gender studies and in uh, faculty of color that had been doing that work. And so now it's named. And, and I, I actually sat on the faculty personnel committee, and I can say that people talk in their narratives about the numbers of students that come to these unofficial office hours. And now that it's part of a criteria, you can say, okay, so not only, and I want to make, I want to take it a step further to say, it's not just honored, it's also part of like, okay, th so that was a lot of work. So how do we view this whole package of work? And that, then that's discussed. And so I, I do think that that's important that we think about that. I do think, I think part of what I think Sheila was partly asking, we address the curriculum, like changing the curricula side with faculty, but not necessarily the promotion and tenure side of existing, changing existing faculty with her original question. And I, I did wonder if that was, was part of it. I was trying not to say that. I know you were, <laughs> but, but as a chair, I can say it. <laughs> Well, I will also say, as we have gotten much more robust in the way we support students, uh, now a vibrant Office of Intercultural Education, which is both a hangout and a programming space, and much more organized academic support, um, purposeful work, absolutely prioritizing the students who don't have other pathways, but you see that it's pretty universal now. The faculty definitely noticed that. And when we, we, a couple of years ago, had a collapse in our staffing in intercultural education, and the faculty really felt it, because then it just all sort of backs up into that informal advising that, that all these faculty are doing. So it's definitely, there's a hydraulics there. And the better we are at structuring programs well, the, the better the classroom experience is for both faculty and students. Uh, I have a quick question. I don't know if somebody else had a question. I, I, I don't know. Go ahead. You haven't asked yet. Um, oh, okay. um, hi, I'm Maureen Linker. Um, associate provost, relatively recent associate provost, and one of the things um, that was part of my portfolio was career services. Um, and I'm also a professor of philosophy. So the idea that somehow um, it's not unfamiliar to me what you were describing earlier, um, Dr. Spencer, about um, it being sort of phobic for faculty to be talking yeah. about um, about careers practically. But after spending about a year now, kind of really trying to do some deeper research about career services and thinking about um, how we can reorganize and restructure it, um, one thing is, and I've shared this with some of the deans, but I really see the social justice piece of career services. Purposeful work, I think, is such an important component. Um, but, so there's one, one level at which we can be working with students. Faculty own the curriculum, and that's an exciting thing to be reminded of, that the changes can be made there. But one of the things I've been thinking about is how to support faculty in <coughs> talking about, um, about work and purposeful work and careers that doesn't, that's not just limited to grad school, or even um, if you're not doing grad school, well, sad, too bad, yeah. you're not, you know. Um, and then also the variety of things that are related. So for instance, students who come in saying, I want, you know, I want to go to med school, um, having that to be able to describe the other ways in which, or the complexity of medicine and, yeah. and public health and other options there. Um, and so I, I like the idea of inviting practitioners in, having practitioner -led courses, but I just wondered, it sounds like you both majorly revamped career services, yet still were managed to use some of the strengths there. But I wondered how that, how those folks are working with faculty or supporting faculty in those kinds of conversations with their students. Yeah. Well, one thing they do. I mean, we start purposeful work discussions in year one. Not what color is your parachute. Not resume writing. But what are you interested in? What experiences can we make sure you have? Working, 
counseling individuals doing these reflective sessions, doing road shows, if you want to look at finance in New York, all those sorts of things. And um, so faculty see that. Um, when we were just getting purposeful work launched, I, I did a major convocation speech that I talked about some thoughts on work. Because I think, I mean, if you read all the great literature and philosophy, if you get two things in life right, love and work, you're kind of done, right? So work is a noble thing to be thinking and talking about. And I think it's been kind of internalized on our campus as not a tactical career services thing. We didn't revamp for uh, career services. We created the Center for Purposeful Work, invited every single staff person over, and I think one left because we did that. And everybody else just was like, it, it was just, it's beautifully led, it's beautifully organized. And um, so it, I think you, I mean, there, there's a lot to read on work. I, I mean, it might be a good thing for a learning community that's both faculty and staff. Um, th and just get sort of a book club going on that. Because we started, I started with two lunches when I, really early when I got there. And just said anybody, I sent it to all campus, anybody interested, faculty and staff, who wants to come talk about work, um, do. And we started there. So. And, and it, it grew organically, but it took a little time. And I would say that the, <clears throat> the staff in Purposeful Work, we invite them to our classes. Because sometimes the students, they don't believe us, right? <laughs> and so they don't. But the staff have richer stories because they're talking to alums. And sometimes they actually need to bring in alums. So when you say pre-med, like, right, I've, I've, in biology, like, 98% of the people, they think they're going to go to med school. And it's not that they can't. It's just that there's a lot of amazing, cool things to do in the world. Um, it, even just the whole world of public health and not straight up med school, which is a great place to find purpose um, because that's a field that cares a lot about social justice. And so we partner with Purple for Work staff. And I'll just like I'll call them up and say, like, do you have any alums that could maybe talk about these things. And it's so much more powerful on Zoom to have an alum that says, yeah, yeah, I wanted to go to med school. But then I found out, like, to run an HIV clinic, it would be better for me to go down this pathway of nursing first. And then I got a public health degree, right? Like, so we do that partnership piece so that we don't actually have to say all of it in the classroom, that, that they come and help us. And that one other thing I would say is I would distinguish this. A lot of places say, Oh, we bought the computer software that links our students to our alum. That there's a way to, you know, you opt into the database if you're an alum. And that link is there. But if none of the fundamentals of what the students think they're doing and who they think they are and what they may be interested in, if those aren't addressed, again, that's a way back end tactic um, that some people front and say that's our that's our brilliant breakthrough in career services. So I think the more you bring it into the the conversation in the curriculum and in the co-curriculum. We've had great purposeful work unplugged series where, I don't know, some parent of ours was high up in Twitter way before Elon Musk um, <laughs> bought it mercifully. Um, anyway, they come, so, so there are all sorts of ways that people in the community have access. And even our students' um, internship talks, faculty come to those at lunch. So it's kind of, um, sort of throughout the circulatory system. Yeah. So can I ask? So it's a very quick question. In your effort to revise the curriculum and, and the uh, assessment piece, did you consider grading, changing the grading? So yeah, we did, and I, I'd have to give a whole other talk, and I know you're tired, so <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yes. I mean, I'll just say yes. We actually did a whole learning community on, on equity and grading. And what is grading anyway? Why do we do it? How is grading connected to learning? Is it? Um, I mean, just, and so that's ongoing, I will say. Um, we're, that's continuing our new Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning. She's launching a series to help people sort of grapple with uh, grading. Also that it's really boring and oppressive to grade. And so like, how do we, how do we make it more entertaining and fun. Um, but yes, that's something we're working on too. 
Sheila, did you have a question? I was just, um, I was, earlier when you, we were talking about the pathways, um, I'm, I'm interested, Joan didn't toot her own horn uh, about our new STEM Scholar uh, NSF grant, but we are starting uh, a cohort building exercise and, you know, again, thinking about the differences between Bates and UM Dearborn, I'm very interested to see how Pathways works to support or break up cohorts that we try to form. I'm interested in seeing we have a huge trans, uh, transfer population, which is going to, you know, sort of complicate this idea of cohorting in order to support students. Um, you know, in, in chemistry, as Sven mentioned, we have a very linear, as you mentioned, curriculum, but in a way that builds our cohorts because the students who come in as a freshman for four years, which is only 50% of our population, of course, you know, they get in these classes and they have three classes a semester with the same group of students. Um, and, and it's a support network that's sort of built in. But clearly, it's not working great. You know, there are good things about it and bad things about it. I'm interested to see how this plays out. Um, or to hear any experiences you've had and how it might play out. You know, can you, you know, head some of our problems off at the path? I'll give one, it's, it's actually, congratulations on that grant. I read about it and I think it's excellent. Um, one thing we were talking about at dinner last night is, so there's, this is about the cohort part of the question, right? So there's, there's the sort of things faculty do to students to make them not in, feel included, but there's also things students do to each other to make, um, them not feel included. And so one thing I would say is early on in whatever cohorts you start to establish so that you're able to invite, the students themselves are able to invite new transfer students into their cohorts, is to really spend some time helping students build what we call pre-professional competencies. And if you want to just quickly Google up something, go to the, like Google uh, the how you should write a med school letter of recommendation for the American Medical Association. The second page has about eight or nine different competencies. When we flash that up for the students and they see that, oh, actually a teamwork is an important component of what I do. Um, cultural competency, learning, relational be, uh, empathy, right? They don't think that that's something that they need to learn and I'm just gonna be like, I'm a scientist too, so no offense to any of my fellow scientists. Like sometimes we just need to be told, like we don't always have the best social skills. So it's like, oh, <laughs> that's something I can build. That's something I can work on. And then the students start to really work on it. So that gives your cohorts a little bit of, <clears throat> they can be more fluid when students know how to bring a new person into the group and listen to them and, and respect their cultural capital and things like that. So that'd be my advice for something to think about. Any last questions or comments? Oh, well, two more. Uh, Gabriella and then Sven. Oh, go ahead, Sven. Okay. Just, it seems so hard to get faculty to realize it's okay to cut down on content. You know, I hear that so many faculty, you know, they come and complain about the poor student scores right now, and, and you know, they need to know A, B, C. And I just wonder, how do you get that mindset, if you have any quick insight stuff? It's okay not to teach the whole book. I mean, again, there are some papers that show that, so I have them read it. Um, there are some people that have experience with having less content and still having successful students, so I have them talk to them, right? I mean, it's, it's a... You just never know what's going to hit that person, like what data it is that they need or what emotion they need to have in order to let go a little bit of the content. Um, but, but I find that most people work the best off of evidence. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. It was very, very thoughtful the way you put it together too and you know made me think a lot about our efforts on practice-based learning obviously but I wanted to ask you about and you kind of touched on that a little bit especially you Dr. Spencer but uh, uh, how aware are the students about the efforts you're doing about purposes, purpose of work 
because um, you know I'm thinking about my students we spend at the beginning of the class 20 minutes over the course goals hey and by the way at the end of the class you'll be able to do this this and the other and I know if I ask them a month later they, they well I'm just learning I don't know why you know I'm just taking this class because I want to or I need to but so how how uh, what about your students how aware are they that this is what is going on and that is why you're teaching this way so that they do find purpose and they do have that satisfaction with their life and what they're doing. So I would say a couple things. I think the language of purposeful work and the sense that they couldn't articulate exactly the typology you saw up there, but the language is, I would say, pretty much universal now. And I'm looking to April, who actually is teaching these students while I'm sitting answering email. Um, and um, so there, the language is universal. I don't think students pay much attention, would be my guess. If a, if a course is a purposeful work and fusion course, I don't think they're paying attention to that. I think the dominant experience is going to be the course experience. And they tend to like and respond to the purposeful work and fusions based on our surveys. Um, I would say practitioner taught courses in short term are very popular, and in fact, when we first put them in, now you know we're trying to stealth get some of this stuff in this liberal arts curriculum, and all of a sudden the evaluations for practitioner taught courses were off the charts good, and we're like, okay, can we just keep that under our hats for a while while everybody catches up? Um, and I don't, if you ask most first years, they've heard, I mean, they've all seen purposeful work, uh, the parents, are the ones who are all about our purposeful work program. And the fact that students come, and it, it tends to be talked about in admissions. But I think until they actually are going through some of the experiences, the job shadows, a counseling session on their interest, strengths, and values, their self-assessments, all of that, I don't think they really get it until they connect in a tangible, instrumental way but you correct me if and I'm wrong. No, and I, I agree with that in general, but I would say a lot of us, when we went through this faculty development, we learned that being transparent with our students, well, work, first of all, we learned it would help our course evaluations. If we told, so like the active learning, right, students are like, I need to learn all the stuff for the MCAT, you know, and so, we, were, we, we learned that, and, and, I, and I think over time, when you start to do more relational teaching, it, yes, I do that on the first day, here's the learning outcomes, but then every time we do something, especially if it seems a little different, I say, oh, I just wanna make sure y'all know that the reason that we're doing this is these studies show that students that do this do better, or our alums tell us that this is the thing. It's just like, almost like a second thing that you just start doing, and that, I think, well, the reason I know it starts to work is then because when you hear the student, like our two students that we showed that talked, like they spoke to a crowd of several hundred, and they were saying things about our program. I was like, oh, you did listen. <laughs> like you did listen to why we do communication really early in the first year we teach you how to talk, right? So I do think it's that transparency piece at the level of the president all the way through the institution trying to say, we're doing this for this reason. We're doing this for this reason. Like these are, you know. Any other questions or final comments? I want to give uh, both uh, President Spencer and Professor Hill a big round of applause. Thank you.